again. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Hayes. I am the Portfolio Director for the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, and uh, we're very grateful for you all being here today for our uh, internship fair. Um, so uh, the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, for those of you that are not familiar, are uh, is a, a state-led investment into making Virginia a global center of excellence in cybersecurity research and education. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by uh, three mission areas. Our first is research, um, research with impact uh, specifically and hopefully economic impact. Um, and our other two mission lines are innovation and commercialization and workforce development. So we believe that by investing in cutting edge uh, cybersecurity research, we can um, lead that can lead to more innovations and commercializations out of research from university labs. And all of that uh, really provides uh, our students at, uh, throughout the Commonwealth at institutions of higher education uh, an opportunity to have really meaningful work experiences while they're working on their degree so that when they do graduate, um, we hope that they stay in Virginia and work for Virginia based companies and uh, continue to you know, flourish in Virginia. Um, so that's really what CCI is all about. Today's internship fair is um, our second virtual internship fair. Um, and so we're very excited to have uh, some panelists joining us here today. See, I knew if I stalled long enough. Good job, good job, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Leanne, you haven't missed much. I'm just going through some introductions here. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, so, you know, CCI is, again, um, that's uh, wh what we're about here is, is providing opportunities for students um, through research and then, of course, creating uh, economic opportunities. So um, with that all being said, I would like to introduce our panel members that are joining us here today. Um, also, just a little bit of information, if you were, um, maybe you joined us here earlier this morning, we had a panel of government cybersecurity experts um, talking about internships that are specific to the government and what that process looks like. Um, and then don't forget, tomorrow is uh, the booth day for the internship fair. So students, if you are interested in speaking to recruiters one-on-one, -on -one, um, they already have your resume because you've uploaded it in order to be here. Um, but then you'll have an opportunity to talk with recruiters and ask any specific questions that you might have. Um, and they might be interested in, in talking with you about opportunities that they have. So make sure to join us tomorrow as well. If you uh, go to your discussion tab, um, there will be a chat box and we do have somebody monitoring those uh, chats there. So um, I have a couple of questions that I'll go through and then uh, we'll get to some, some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please feel free to post it there. Okay, so joining us on the panel this morning, um, first is the CEO of Civilian Cyber. Uh, under Bobby's guidance, Civilian Cyber has established itself as a leader in technology-driven workforce development, and the company serves as the workforce lead for various prominent state and national initiatives. So thanks for joining us, Bobby. Thank you. We also have Leon Nash, Principal of Cyber and Strategic Risk at Deloitte. Um, he is the, uh, he currently serves as Deloitte's U.S. consumer cyber leader, the cyber internet of things leader for the connected vehicle practice, and is the service line champion for cybersecurity of the future of mobility. Thanks for joining us, Leon. Thanks for having me, Sarah. And then finally, um, we have David Hill, the program director for Azure Global at Microsoft. Um, he is, um, excuse me, uh, at, in Azure Global, it's an engineering organization within Microsoft Azure. Uh, David manages a team of program managers and engineers who are working to enable Microsoft and its customers to be successful across a set of challenges around workforce readiness and program protection through the creation of software and tooling to drive efficiency and scale. So thanks for joining us, David. Okay, so like I said, I um, have a couple of questions that I'll go through here and then we'll take questions. Um, gentlemen, um, I'll just kind of pick somebody at random to answer the first question. <laughs> um, uh, David, perhaps you can start us off. Um, applying for internships can be an overwhelming process. What advice would you give students applying for their first internship? uh don't be scared to apply to, to many opportunities i think you know it's very competitive out there right now there's a lot of demand but the, the benefit is there's a lot of demand for talent i think companies are hungry as people are coming you know as work are working through the pandemic to find new talent uh there's a lot of 
energy out there for people looking for new roles. And so it's creating new opportunities for people to come into companies uh, younger in their career, which is exciting. And I think the, one of the things that I learned when I was looking for internships in college was is that you know, don't be discouraged by ones that don't pan out. There's there's a lot of opportunity out there and continue to keep looking. And, you know, it's really about building relationships because, you know, there might not be an opportunity for, you know, an internship this summer or whatever it looks like. But, you know, the following summer that the company will have your profile and maybe remember your conversation or the person at the booth might remember you. And there might be an opportunity the following year. And I've seen that before. All right. Thanks. Leon, would you like to add anything? Advice to give students to applying for their first internship? I'd say pull together a plan. I mean, I, I think there, I mean, every organization is different in terms of, you know, their timing, um, you know, what they're looking for in terms of information, really to take the time to plan and be structured um, and then around your approach to internships. You know, obviously there's gonna be a lot of homework uh, that you have to do in and around that, researching companies, researching organizations, trying to find the opportunities that fit the things that you want to do or you're interested in doing, but really putting together a plan because, you know, it, it can start um, here in the here in the fall, really, and, and depending on the organization, go on into the spring. Right? And so to having that plan around when things are due, what you need to pull together, really, I think will help you, you know, put yourself in the best position for each one of these um, potential internships that you might, uh, you know, put yourself um, in the mix for. Great. Thanks. Bobby, how about you? Anything to add? Yeah, uh, obviously great advice uh, from uh, both gentlemen. Uh, the only thing I would add is that you're not alone. And what I mean by that is that uh, obviously if you're in school, you have teachers, you have, you know, career services, uh, you have friends, you have your your parents' friends, you, you know, you have your friends' parents, you have all these different people that are out there that, you know, look around, uh, don't be don't be shy about asking for help uh, because, you know, I believe that David mentioned networking, uh, you know, which is great when you get out there and you're talking to these folks and, and capture all that information. If you talk to a person at a booth, get their card, capture that information because that's somebody you can call later. But but again, you already have a network, right? Uh, a lot of us don't realize that we have a built in network that, uh, that a lot of people and it's, it's a lot bigger than you by yourself. And if you're willing to engage that, and I believe both gentlemen have said it, don't be shy, you know, have a plan, don't be shy, uh, go after it. it. You know, the if you sit around and you think that things are gonna show up on your doorstep uh, because you've got a good grade or you've done this, well, it's just not how it works. You've gotta go after it. And uh, and, and that's what I would say. And, and again, leverage those things that are already in your life that, you know, you grew up around and, and in your school. Great, thank you. So the next question, and we'll just kind of maybe go back in, uh, in reverse order this time is, um, in today's continued COVID climate, the internship landscape has transitioned to remote and hybrid. How has your organization or institution utilized interns within a remote or hybrid setting? And can you also share how an intern provides value in that kind of environment? Yeah, so reverse order, I'm assuming that means me. So um, yeah, we, uh, we're we lucky in some respects in that um, I started the company prior to the pandemic, uh, like literally a month prior to the pandemic uh, coming along. Uh, which is a great time to start a company, by the way. But um, the we established the company as a remote workforce company. We, you know, we saw the writing on the wall that that's how it was headed, the direction it was headed anyway. And so we had built in a lot of processes for that. And, and those types of things were one is we're, you know, we use SharePoint for instance for file management, things like that. So we make sure that we're very structured in where, you know, how do you get to documentation? How do you access different things that you need to do your work, regardless of an intern or not? The other thing I would say is that with our interns, we uh, we obviously give them mentorship and we believe in that very strongly. And it's not just that they're showing up and working, but we also do treat them as a as another worker in the organization. We don't make them, quote unquote, special uh, because they're interns. We want them to get that experience while also providing that mentorship. Um, just as with any worker, we do routine meetings with them as well. And we're going to those meetings to have the camera on so we can see them because they're green right uh, and and you know it's not a bad thing to say but if you're green you may say you understand something if i see your face i know you do not understand what i'm talking about so it allows me to follow up and do those types of things and uh, the other thing is is bring them on to where it's not just one-on-one -on -one conversations but it's other interns or you know in a, a group where there's other leaders other people in the organization that are also part of that conversation so that they can experience that and, and get that comfort level and then the last thing I'll say, and I believe in this in business in general, is um, it's not all about the work either. It's about them as human beings. It's about their personal life. What do they want to do? 
or a juncture of their life and moving into a new place. Well, let's, you know, hey, that's that's something interesting. Let's talk about that. Um, and, and again, mentoring, not just for the job, but mentoring for them moving out as a new people in life, I think is very important. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I guess I'll go next. So um, similar to Bobby and, and his organization, I mean, we, we at Deloitte also have you know, um, the infrastructure in place really that supported uh, a quick and easy transition to remote working, right? I mean, you think about the vast majority of what we do from a consulting perspective, ideally um, for, for the vast majority of the folks at Deloitte, you know, we're out at client sites typically during the week um, and, and spending that time. And, you know, um, when we when COVID happened, obviously we had to ha have that uh, seamless transition to uh, you know 100% workforce. It was relatively easy for us. We had la everyone had laptops, everyone had you know access to VPNs and all the different solutions. And as similar to what Bobby mentioned, all the different collaboration tools, et cetera. You know, when we get interns uh, that come on board, we enable them with all of those technologies um, as well to be able to you know quickly and easily adapt um, and, and integrate with the team. Uh, the other thing that we do for our interns, and we do this basically for all levels um, of new hires, whether it's a campus hire or a um, experience hire coming on board to Deloitte, we enable them with a support system, right? And what that means is that beyond just the the project that you you're on or the projects you may be on, um, where our goal is to make sure that you have a support system and um, what we call first a buddy, uh, someone that's you know that's typically around the same level um, that can sort of explain the the who's who, the what's what um and, and where it is uh at deloitte right because you know in terms of figuring out what are the subtle little things like how, how do you submit your time how do you do all these things we typically assign uh, a buddy to do that also you'll have a coach or a mentor someone that's going to take the time and sort of just sort of help you figure out you know um you know what it is uh you you're you're doing at deloitte what it is that you want to do at deloitte you know because we always look at internships really as an opportunity to showcase you know, all of the things you can potentially do, right? And, and I always say, and I, I give advice to both interns and, and, and our campus hires that this is an opportunity, not only for you to audition your skills and capabilities and your interests in learning and, and sort of getting a taste of a little bit of everything um, in terms of the different types of work that we do, but it's also um, Deloitte's opportunity, right? To showcase and, and audition with you, right? Is this what you want to do? Is this what you want to um, get involved in, in terms of consulting, in terms of the type of consulting, obviously cybersecurity being one of them, it really allows you to get um, a broad uh, experience. So your internship should give you a broad experience in terms of um, you know, uh, understanding the different types of uh, services and capabilities and work um, you know, that the organization that you're working with provides. And, and so we try to do that at least within Deloitte um, to give you a, a, a wide variety, because hopefully when you go when you, after the internship, when you go back to school, and now if you're really interested in doing the things that you did over the course of the internship, really now you can start to tailor your your courseware um, to sort of meet and match um, the type of work and, and what you want to do um, after you graduate. So it, it really gives you a great opportunity to be able to tailor um, then school and, and all the other extra, extracurricular activities. To, to further give you greater insight and, and experience um, in this field, uh, if that's, this is what you you know you desire to do. So, you know, I look at um, the other things that we do for for internships. Yeah, I mean, obviously working closely um, virtually with their team, so getting integrated with the engagement, the project teams that they're on, um, and, and obviously participating in a number of virtual events. We had a, a lot of you know. More, more than normal, I think, uh, a lot of social um, interaction, right? Because, you know, I think ultimately, as, as we are starting to come out of the pandemic, one of the things that we tried to maintain was that social connection, that, um, you know, interaction, even if it's, you know, primarily over Zoom um, and, and uh, you know, other, um, you know, collaboration tools. So we, we integrated a whole lot more of those types of activities on a social level just to have people, um, you know, socially connect um, in and outside, not only the projects, but then also our service offering in, in terms of cybersecurity. Great, thank you. You're David? Yeah, I think, you know, very fortunate to work here at Microsoft. You know, we are a, a digital first company in a lot of ways, and a lot of the ways that we had the tools in place, you know, as, as Bobby and Leon said, that to, to, to go remote rather quickly and rather easily, given all of our connectivity that we have as a company. So that was super advantageous for us. You know, for interns, you know, there's definitely was some challenges. Microsoft has a lot of energy and enthusiasm about our intern program. You know, on an annual basis before the pandemic, we were bringing 
all of our interns to our, our flagship campus here in, at Redmond, Washington. And we had a lot of programming and events around that. So there was definitely a change, a change for Microsoft. You know, we largely see our intern class as our next set of full-time employees. We have a very high conversion rate. And so we're really investing in those interns the same way we would a new hire. We embed our interns deeply into engineering teams, just as we would with a new employee. A lot of the same things that Leon said around having a support structure, having a mentor, having a buddy really helps to enable that success. Uh, you know, Microsoft, as I mentioned, is is, is ready to, to be a remote company and we're, we're, we're embracing hybrid as part of that. I think one of the impacts on our intern programs has been that you know, we're having to look for new ways to create that community and create those relationships between the other other interns and how do we continue creating excitement you know, inside of that intern program over the course of the summer where we can't have activities on campus and things like that. But uh, it's been going well. We have you know, a large intern class you know, uh, this past summer and you know, hopefully we can continue to figure out a hybrid model which works well for everybody. And I think that's, that's something that we're gonna continue to work more on. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Leanne, we'll start with you this time. Um, so um, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the areas of cybersecurity that Deloitte is seeing that's creating the most risk for your clients and what strategies is Deloitte taking to mitigate those risks? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's numerous in terms of areas I feel in, that are really taking hold. And I'll, I'll probably put it in the context of a number of business movements, right? And, and, you know, you'll hear a lot of talk and conversation around digital transformation, right? And, and uh, you know, organizations that have typically been brick and mortar, you know, factories or, or you know, very accustomed to developing and building traditional things right now have had to transfer and, and transition themselves into you know uh, digital presence or digital products etc and then that also feeds into um uh you know the internet of things and it, that's a key area that i focus on in terms of helping organizations that are building products in and around the internet of things um you know to incorporate cybersecurity into those tools just general practices and um in terms of how they build and design and then ongoing how they monitor those capabilities so let me take a step back and talk about that digital transformation. So what we saw with COVID and COVID for a lot of organizations, a lot of companies, really, if they weren't already involved or, or initiating a digital transformation, um, they were forced to do so, right? Because you could no longer go into a store to go buy something. You had to go on their website, right? And so now they had to enable, um, you know, uh, a, a digital presence and an online storefront to be able to still interact with you, the customer. Um, to be able to sell their goods or sell their services to you. Um, and so, you know, when I look at a, a key business movement, that's something that's been creating a lot of challenges for, for many and risk for a lot of our clients because, you know, in the rush or in the haste to do that, to enable those technologies. And then sometimes, you know, when you think about what happened over the past year with COVID, where organizations were at times hesitant to spend um, money on certain things, oftentimes cybersecurity, I'll say, you know, is seen as like insurance, right? People only want to buy enough, uh, you know, until they have an event or an incident that requires that that said insurance, and then they wish they had more. They wish they would have done more, um, you know, to bolster or prevent, um, you know, these things types of things from happening. So I say this because as a lot of organizations enabled those storefronts, if they were in a rush to do that, if they were in haste to to roll out these technologies, sometimes what we've seen over the the past. 10, 15, 20 years, is that cybersecurity wasn't a consideration while they were building it, while they were developing and rolling out. And then so as these things, uh, these cyber events have happened, and obviously they've stepped up in, in, um, in frequency, in severity uh, for many of our clients, how they are addressing cybersecurity, you know, really has now come into the forefront, right? So you see that big risk in terms of how they're for digital transformation, for Internet of Things, how they're looking now spending more time to build cybersecurity better practices into the product up front. And you'll hear a lot of um, uh, talk around shifting left and DevSecOps and really bringing um, security into the forefront and into the uh, process. Because I'll tell a lot of my clients, it's far cheaper and, and, and more cost, cost effective for you to build the cybersecurity in from the beginning than for us to go and try to retrofit cybersecurity into something you've already built a certain way and now we have to go, you know, sort of run the pipes in and around and, and, you know, work around the existing things that they have in place. And so, you know, we look at that and then the worst case scenario is that it, it costs even 
significantly more to then um, deal with a cyber event. Um, and I've worked in a couple of client environments where they had cyber events that shut the entire enterprise down, shut their entire business down, you know, and having to rebuild all that stuff from the from the ground up, all of your your servers, your laptops, everything is not a pretty thing. And it actually it'll cost two, three, four, five times more to, to go and do that after an event. And so so when we look at those risks, what what I really focus or what we really focus at Deloitte in terms of trying to get, get our clients to be proactive and looking at, you know, what can they do to prevent these things? Um, obviously, you know, being mindful with costs, right? Because if they had unlimited dollars, we could, you know, we, we could secure everything and put a lock on every potential door. But you, if you look at your house as an example, you wouldn't do that on every door. You'd probably do it on the main entry points um, coming in and out of your house. And that's typically the model that we're trying to do is, is finding the cyber so security solution that's going to be fit for purpose for their organization. But in order to do that, you need to have a, a clear understanding of what um, you know, what your most important things are, what we typically call your crown jewels. What do you want, what, what must you protect versus what should you protect or what would be nice to protect in terms of the organization? So, so really enabling our clients to get visibility into what's important to them and then what their key points of, of access or entry are uh, to that data and helping them then develop a strategy and plan around that. And then, you know, once you've built the security in and around, you know, let's say the, um, you know, their enterprise systems, how do you maintain vigilance and monitoring to be able to keep your eyes on all the things that you're protecting because products are continuously changing in terms of upgrades and patches you know um, new applications business applications are constantly being rolled out and new products are being developed so it's a, it's a constantly changing environment for many of our clients so really keeping that vigilance that watchfulness on that is is one of the other things that we'll focus on fantastic thank you David, I'll let you jump in next. Um, maybe some of the, the biggest areas of cybersecurity that, that you all are seeing or that um, partners or clients are facing and, and what's Microsoft doing? Yeah, you know, you know Microsoft, you know, and, and being part of Azure, you know, really we are working on how do we make the cloud really more resilient so that, you know, we can, all of our customers who are consuming cloud technologies from Microsoft, you know, we're raising the bar for, for all of our customers at one time. We all also see the cloud itself as an attack vector and we have lots of lots of you know activity all the time around how do we how do we add resilience you know with, at Microsoft as well. You know, uh, you know, we were Microsoft was just in uh, in the DC area um, I think maybe a week and a half ago where we announced that we were going to be investing twenty billion dollars over the next five years uh, into the cybersecurity department area to add resiliency to the cloud and to increase you know, national security capabilities for a lot of the you know, Department of Defense other, and other um, you know, government agencies. So, you know, we're really seeing additional, you know, the pandemic has only accelerated adoption of, you know, not just Microsoft collaborative, you know, collaborative tools, but a lot around, as Leon was saying, technologies and platforms as, as businesses are having to transition to the cloud. And, you know, Microsoft has seen the impact that, you know, cloud incidents can have on customers. And so we're really, you know, working to invest as a company to add Add that resiliency and and cybersecurity best you know practices that can help make all of our customers more secure. So uh, we're definitely cognizant of that, and it's definitely an area of focus for Microsoft. Uh, we are in a lead certified building, so lights go off. Bobby, anything you'd like to add on things that you're seeing? Yeah, and, and apologies if you hear a random beep. My computer is acting kind of weird, so if you do hear that, apologies. Uh, but uh, that being the case, I, I like that, uh, you know, I, I do equate uh, to, Leon, what you were saying. It's kind of like building a house, putting the walls up, and then saying, okay, now we're going to put the plumbing in. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work out very well. Very difficult, very expensive as well. But um, the, a lot of the problems that we're seeing is, and, and they really – aren't seen as much, but if you look at things like some of the uh, the hacks that have happened, even on national scale, it happens with small vendors or, or, or whatever, and then it works its way up. And so when you have small organizations, especially small to medium sized companies, they really don't understand cybersecurity at all. And in fact, uh, I, I mean, I would dare say they, they probably are outsourcing some of their technology or they're very using very small tools and they're getting hit hard by this and they don't have the capability in many cases to even hire a full-time person. So. Uh, you know, how we can get them some support where they, you know, don't have to hire that full time person, but they're still secure. And it's it's a it's a very difficult um, question to answer. It's not just about having more people in, at that point. Uh, the other one that was alluded to by both Leon and David is the uh, idea of all these new tools. 
there are so many new tools that come on the market every day in regards to cybersecurity and so many changes to existing tools that stay in keeping up to pace with that, whether that be, you know, cloud tools like Azure, uh, whether it be, you know, just new tools that are just looking at, you know, uh, your system logs or whatever, you got to have people that actually manage those tools and have that capability. And uh, a lot of the uh, organizations I'm talking with, they, they want people that understand cybersecurity, but they also want to have people that understand how to use this tool or that tool or that tool. And finding people that just have the cybersecurity background is hard enough, much less to find that have the, uh, the, the capability to use those tools. And then the last thing I would say is the proliferation of data. Uh, you know, we talk about the systems and cloud and all of that, and that's one way that data, more data is getting out. But we're also within our own uh, organizations. Companies are using data to drive decision making, to, you know, uh, do just do all kinds of different things with it. They're sharing that data with other customers. They're data is being passed around I mean, you know in, in a crazy crazy way right now in a crazy large way and quite honestly i, I don't have any numbers on this but I, I would dare suspect that the vast majority of it is being passed around without a lot of security being taken into account and so as we use more data for decision making as we use more data to just you know gain these insights business intelligence uh, well, you've got to make sure that's secure because if it gets in the wrong hands it maybe that's not the problem but that data allows you to get to something else some problems for you. So a uh, proliferation of data uh, and how to handle that through data governance, some other things is, is critically important. And it's only really been started to talk about, really started to talk about it over the last five years. And it's, it's not really mature yet, data governance. So that's a huge one as well. Great, thank you. Um, so now uh, some questions that um, I think um, students are always kind of wondering is, you know, what are the things that might help me get a leg up, um, whether for it's a, it's an internship or whether it's for you know later when I'm entering the job market? Um, so, are there any cybersecurity certifications that are preferred or more valuable to an organization than others, or that you might recommend, Bobby? Uh, yeah, I think the easy ones just come out of the gate. You just go look at. Uh, I mean, if you're already going down that career path, uh, Network Plus, Security Plus. I think those are are just pretty standard basic certifications that you need to go after. And if you've already been taking some classes, you you may not be fully prepared, but you're probably pretty darn close if you're not fully prepared. So those those are for me, just kind of like um, entry level type certifications to get you out of the gate. And um, you know, that would be my answer. I mean, there's there's some other ones you can get, you know, get things like, I think A plus certification is great just because it gives you a broader view of things that are happening. Uh, and a lot of folks don't realize that cybersecurity is about desktop support as well, installing new software, things like that. So. You know, is some things, you know, all, all of that stuff's great, but yeah, pure cybersecurity, uh, network plus security plus, I think those are the my my favorite ones to for new folks. Anyone or David, what would you add to that? Well, some of the certifications that Microsoft looks for around cybersecurity is like I think it's CCSP, which is like cloud cybersecurity um, professional or CISSP, you know, or a couple of the ones that you know are probably beyond what, what Bobby was hitting on, but like you know, we don't you know. Uh, and Microsoft for people coming in, you know, we don't really expect a lot of those certifications. I mean, really, it's about bringing your fundamental school sets from school, and they're learning, you know, being willing to apply them to to Microsoft technologies. And you know, we're going to invest the time and energy as a company to get people trained and working and delivering impact at, at, at you know what Microsoft's problems are. Right. So um, those are great additions, but I would say not a not a requirement for coming out of school to to be ready for a career at Microsoft. Thank you. Leon? Uh, not much more to add. I mean, I, I think we've covered a lot of the, the major certifications. I, I would have focused on the, the CISP as well, but the CISP actually requires that you have a few years of experience. Yeah, that's the only problem with that one. Yeah. Yep. Um, and the only other thing I, I would add, I mean, you know, you know, if you think about, obviously, you know, David, you mentioned the, the strong movement to cloud, and that's a big thing across every every aspect of business. Everything is moving to the cloud in terms of even the stuff I do with clients in and around the connected and autonomous vehicle, it's going to be dependent on the cloud to be able to do that. I'd start saying, I mean, things you can start to do now are, are, are looking at cloud certifications um, and, and, you know, specifically, you know, the, the disciplines in and around cybersecurity, because I think that's where, while, while cloud offers a lot of great opportunities to accelerate, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, opportunities for uh, organizations to, um, to make those that digital transformation that I mentioned earlier, uh, there's still a lot of confusion, I think, out in the space um, in terms of how to use cloud and what, um, like you know, Microsoft, for example, around Azure would be responsible for versus what the uh, the consumer of the cloud service is responsible for. 
and really understanding where that ownership and responsibility lies. And that, that I think is a great opportunity to help a lot of those organizations that Bobby mentioned, the smaller, even larger organizations that, you know, presume that, well, I, I bought the, I bought the cloud service. Well, they're taking care of everything for me. Not, no, that's not always the case. Right. And you have, they have to understand what they're doing and, and sort of what I mentioned earlier in terms of the ongoing monitoring, all it takes is for someone to accidentally make a, a container public. And now all your, all that data, that Bobby was mentioning is now openly available. And, and it happens, you know, whether it's typically by accident, all right? And someone's trying to troubleshoot something and trying to fix something. But that's where I think there's a lot of great opportunities to really help organizations adopt cloud. Um, and, and, but you, have, you, have, you yourself have to understand the platforms, the, the security capabilities, how to configure, how to monitor, how to leverage the, the um, native tools that exist uh, within Azure and to be able to, to, be able to um, help organizations figure out and manage the cybersecurity in and around the cloud platforms as well. Hey, Sarah, can I add one small thing to that as well? Yeah. Uh, I think this is very important. This is this is something I think is extremely important. Um, you mentioned cybersecurity certifications. I do believe also just, and it kind of goes with what Liam was saying, it's also really important to look at other things besides just pure cybersecurity and, uh, you know, understand those surrounding pieces of technology, understand a little bit about how business works. Uh, having some of that a well-rounded uh, background when you're going in for internships, at least for me, if I see somebody who understands those other aspects, obviously they have a focus in cybersecurity. I find that to be really, then they know how to apply it. They know how to use it. They know how to, you know, how it, how the context of it is uh, within the larger organization. So I would advise any of the students that are out there, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you just have to lean on your cybersecurity and those certifications. If you have other things in your background, work experience, um, you know, understand other technologies, bring those to the forefront as well. They will be appreciated from, um, from uh, hiring persons. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so shifting just a tad, um, you know, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, particularly in Northern Virginia, but also on the on the coast, we have a, a really large federal presence. And um, many of the companies that are privately owned in, in, um, and operate in Virginia um, have a federal practice because they, they have to work with the, the, the federal government. Um, and so uh, a question that we have that often comes up um, that students ask is, um, when it comes to security clearances, do companies typically um, provide that to interns or is it just employees? Do you, do you see that interns um, require a type of background check or clearance in some of the projects that you might place them in? Or is that usually reserved for just uh, employees? David, let's start with you. Sure. I mean, Microsoft, you know, has been working with the federal government for 40 plus years or something like that. You know, we recently have, have uh, substantially increased our investment with the federal government around the cloud, and we're making a lot of announcements in that vein. You know, and, and the classified cloud is one of the things we're, we're just starting to offer to customers. I think that we are seeing uh, a, a demand for individuals with security clearances. We, we have been recruiting interns with security clearances uh, that have existing security clearances coming from other uh, defense agencies uh, or customers in prior internships, and that's that those people are able to to add immediate impact inside of some of those scenarios. Uh, you know, Microsoft, I would say, is not yet you know at our maturity point where we're working to put people through the clearance process as an intern, but it's definitely something we aspire to as a company to be able to have a robust intern pipeline where we can you know get people into that space that are excited about working with the federal government in the secure in the secure environment and we can get people processing you know for that type of work uh, but if you have existing security clearance we definitely have programs that we're excited to recruit interns around that are supporting those efforts today great thank you leon Similar, similar to uh, what David mentioned at Microsoft, Deloitte does, you know, follows a similar practice and structure, right? So within our government and public sector practices, where typically our federal government clients reside, um, you know, similarly, if, if you have an existing, you know, clearance um, as an intern, uh, you know, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll work with that. But typically it's uh, for our employees, because um, obviously I, I think sort of similar to what David mentioned, right? There's a level of effort in terms of, you know, formally going through that background check and, and for, conducting that investigation that takes time. And we wouldn't want that to prevent you from, you know, ma maximizing and getting the most of your internship, right? Because typically our, our internships um, will run anywhere from six to eight weeks. 
Um, and if we have to spend, you know, <laughs> a couple of weeks getting, you know, working through the investigation, it, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a valuable and viable experience for the, uh, for the intern. Um, so yeah, typically we, that's, it's relegated to, um, to employees, uh, full-time employees that are coming on board to go through a, a net new, um, uh, background and in investigation to get clearance. So. Great. Thanks. Bobby, did you have anything to add? You're muted. Away from you, but uh, yeah, I, I sit on a uh, advisory uh, committee for the state that uh, Virginia Tech, a couple other universities, as well as some state agencies and private industry, and it's uh, around interns, experiential learning, all this good stuff. And one of the questions that we're looking at right now is exactly this one: how how do we, you know, because it's the chicken or the egg, right? We you can't work in this environment if you don't have a clearance. But you can't get a clearance because, quite honestly, it doesn't make any sense for a business to invest that money and that time in somebody that's only going to be there eight weeks just to be blunt about it. So, um, so how do we how do we work around that? That's a question we're asking, and, and I believe Leon and David uh, hit on it very well. That being said, uh, there are other options as well. We do a, we do a lot of apprenticeships as well, for instance, and apprenticeships are longer term. They're really about hiring people, and it does have that you know that related technical instruction that can be going to college while you're working for the organization with the idea that you'll continue working there when you're done. And in those situations, that makes sense, you know, to go get a, um, a security clearance. But it's 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 a real hard question when you're talking about, you know, even a, even a few month long um, internship, just because the value proposition for the company is it's it's just very difficult to to make that. Indeed, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Those are the the questions that I had. Um, now I'm going to switch over to some of the questions that we've been fielding from the audience. Um, so I think this one um, might vary, or it may not, um, but so I'll, I'll let everyone uh, jump in to answer this one. And the question is around um, international students. Um, so particularly if a student is here on a student visa, are they uh, usually eligible for an internship within your organization um, or, or a fellowship or apprenticeship, as you were mentioning, Bobby? So student visas. Yeah, the, the apprenticeships can be difficult uh, for a variety of reasons, just because of uh, federal dollars that support those and some things like that. So they can be difficult. Uh, the internships, though, um, yeah, our experience is that they are available for that. Uh, it, it depends on the situation of the person. Are they here short term? Are they here long term? Uh, you know, what skills do they have? There, there's a lot that goes into it. And quite honestly, I, I do think it can be a little more difficult for them. Uh, than, it, than it would be for someone who's going to be here long term, because again, it's an investment uh, type question. That's how, that's how I've, I've seen it. And, um, but yeah, I still think there's plenty of opportunity though. Okay. Leon? Yeah, no, it's similar. Um, as long as, you know, I, I'll, I'll say as long as for our campus hires, our internships, et cetera, as long as they, uh, you know, the positions, you know, are, are going to be filled by folks that are legally authorized to work. So as long as they have that authorization to work in the U.S., Yes, um, you know, international stool, uh, students, um, you know, can um, can be eligible for internships or fellowships or or uh, campus hires as well. Thank you. I would say my answer is highly aligned with Leon's. You know, if you have authorization to work in the United States, we have plenty of opportunities for international students, um, especially you're, you're looking at always leveraging that pipeline for. You know, if people are returning home at some point, you know, we have opportunities with Microsoft around the world, and we're definitely looking to to build those you know relationships so that people can contribute, maybe some other where, other place. Great, thanks. Um, so here's a, a question that always kind of comes up: um, Are the internships from your organization typically paid, or are they unpaid? Uh, paid. 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 Great. All right, everybody, you heard it. <laughs> Get your resumes ready. Um, and then uh, somebody was asking about, what do you think about contacting hiring managers, asking about potential opportunities through LinkedIn or email? So do you encourage kind of cold calling or cold emailing these days? Well, I'll, I'll start off. I'm, I'm a firm believer by all means necessary, um, you know, in, in reaching out. So, but I, I agree, I think Bobby, you touched on it earlier. It's all about your network, and and you know, and my so I'll give I'll share with you my uh, my oldest daughter graduated from college, you know, in the midst of the pandemic, right? And and her biggest networking opportunity, I I I, I tried to drop hints. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm here to help. I can help. Um, and she sort of said, nope, I'm going to go do my own thing. And I said, okay. So you know, she looked for she sought employment for a while, and it wasn't until she finally said, okay, I, I'm this is this is driving me crazy. Dad, can you help? 
Yes, yes, I can. Because I, I, you know, I have a big network. I know a lot of folks that, you know, based on all the cybersecurity work I've done in my career, like I know a lot of folks in the industries that she wanted to get into. You know, she lives in the Bay Area. Um, and so she's, you know, I was able to get her connected with a lot of folks. But I always say you have to use your network. So, yes, I, I do agree in, in using, um, you know, uh, LinkedIn and other solutions like that to be able to try to identify opportunities. But if you can get there directly, if you know someone that's there, or you know someone that's that knows someone that works in that organization. It's always best to get an internal referral and internal connection. And and I, I'll always say you know that networking aspect. Like I said, I think a lot of people overlook in terms of you know realizing you can if you don't know someone, you can actually go meet someone. You can find a way to connect. Um, you know, because it's all about relationships. You know, I, I remember a saying growing up. You know, um, who you know gets you in. What you know allows you to stay, right? Um, and and so I've always applied that to my life in terms of. How do you figure out how do you get to meet someone and, and using every opportunity, even if you're sitting next to someone on a flight, right? And you know, there's an opportunity to get into a conversation. You'll never know um, who and where folks work and, and how you know they might have a connection that uh, could be beneficial to you, you know, somewhere down there, whether it's internships or or some other aspect of your life. You never know. And you know, you have to initiate those conversations. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Uh, plus one for the hustle. I will say that uh, <laughs> I, I get I get a lot of a lot of noise on LinkedIn, so it's a really hard space for me to to respond to people. I definitely, you know, uh, I would agree with Leon. If if you have a connection on LinkedIn that maybe knows somebody else directly that can do an introduction or some type of you know you know direct connection, that's going to be a much more you know palatable or probably higher chance for response or engagement than someone cold calling. But you should definitely do it because you never know. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. It's like, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, you can't be shy. That's how I look at it. You you got to go after it. It's not going to come to you. Um, and especially when you're young and new, uh, you, you just got to go after it. And, and I agree. I get a lot of noise on LinkedIn as well. Uh, so if somebody does send me something and I, I don't, for whatever reason, don't get to it, I don't feel bad about it. I'm not mad at them. So, you know, there's, there's no harm, no foul. And sometimes you do respond. I've, I have responded to those things in the past and quite honestly, a lot fall through just cause of the volume of it. Um, the other thing I would say is look for uh, industry organizations, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, attending something because, you know, this is how we do things right now, of course, but uh, you know, they're coming back where you can go to the local, you know, go to that local restaurant and you're all having a drink together and you all know cybersecurity. There's a lot of heavy hitters in there. A lot of people with jobs in there go and network like that. And if they, and if they don't have the job, they'll know somebody who does. So uh, get yourself out there, start networking, uh, create new networks as well. And, what I mentioned earlier about anytime you meet somebody, if you have any kind of rapport with them whatsoever, get their card, get their name, write it down. Uh, you know, that's an opportunity to call somebody right there. You have a number, you have an email address. So utilize those things. And I'll, I'll add a personal experience as well to this conversation. Um, I have the, the current position that I do from a networking event um, from my graduate school alumni. Uh, group that emailed and said, hey, there is a, an event, a speaker, and a happy hour. Do you want to come? Sure, why not? I was working for myself at the time, so I was employed, but you know, I was, um, I was a, an independent contractor and consulting and project management, and so that's a way for me to potentially meet new clients. Um, and instead, I was introduced uh, to somebody who was running this, who was about to start this new program that just sounded so incredibly interesting to me, got an introduction, exchanged cards, connected on LinkedIn. He posted or shared the, the job opening when it opened on his LinkedIn profile. And here you go, you know, three years later, this is the position that I'm sitting in. Um, so I would also say, uh, particularly for those of you that are graduating soon, or maybe you're moving to a new location that you've never been to before, connect with your school's alumni group, connect with your, any organization that you were involved with in school, if they have an alumni group, connect with your local chapter. If you're in a sorority or a fraternity or um, a, a, an industry uh, organization that has chapters locally, find those, connect with those. It's an instant you know, social calendar, but it's also instant networking for professional opportunities. And you just never know what, uh, what could come across your inbox. So I, I would say absolutely. Um, I agree with the gentleman here is, is use your network to your advantage. Um, okay, so a couple of other questions. Um, 
So um, are you looking for cybersecurity majors as interns or um, information technology majors as well? So I guess really broadly speaking is, or when you're looking for interns, um, are you, is it very specific uh, in terms of what the major is or can it be a little bit broader? So maybe maybe I'll, I'll start and, and I'll say at Deloitte, I mean, we're, we're open to, to many majors. So ideally, yes, we are looking for cybersecurity focused majors. It's nice to have a few of those, but I'll share with everyone here. So, I, I mean, my, my degree is in civil engineering, right? And so and we also look at engineering. We also look at, you know, other adjacent, um, you know, ma uh, uh, majors for, for in individuals that, you know, um, that will have a strong either technology or business acumen. Um, that ultimately can help, uh, you know, help better understand and ultimately, I think it was Bobby, you said um, how to apply cybersecurity uh, to uh, to business and how organizations tend to deliver business. I'll share with you also that I've, I've worked with cybersecurity professionals that, have, you know, um, you know, archaeological majors, right? I mean, all types of, you know, business, um, English majors. I mean, so we, you know, we take all types of um, skill sets because ultimately we do believe in diversity. Um, of, of skill set, diversity of experience, et cetera, that I think, you know, brings different perspectives and different understandings. Like, so I'll share with you in our cyber threat intelligent practice, you know, we'll, we'll bring those different types of majors, not just cybersecurity majors, because we want people to look at problems from different angles, from different perspectives. And ultimately that diversity of, of people, experience, knowledge, and skill set is ultimately what we feel makes for a successful cybersecurity professional and a successful cybersecurity practice as a whole. Yeah, no, and we we uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very similar to to what Liam was saying, and and quite honestly, and I'm going to say this in a, in the nicest way possible because we've taken a few people in uh, the persons that are coming out with cybersecurity degrees, for that matter, uh, information technology degrees, they're not ready anyway. To be blunt with you, uh, they they require additional training, they require additional you know uh, you know just to get into the workforce, and 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 that, and there's some things that I think uh, you know that David Leon and I probably take for granted uh, that you know people would know, and then we go, oh man, they don't know it. I, I don't understand how they can't know this. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to pick on anyone. Um, uh, that's not my intent. But what I am saying is, is that if you have any kind of technology, really good, solid technology foundation, it's pretty easy to bend you into cybersecurity or or another direction. And that's that's really what what it is about for me, because I, I don't expect you to be ready anyway, to be blunt about it. So um, so anyway, that's 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 what I would uh, say for my answer. I would say, you know, sum up Microsoft internships around technical aptitude, uh, passion for what we're working on and wanting to drive change or impact. You know, and if you have those types of things, you know, we're looking for individuals. Uh, you know, it's great that you have experiences or you have the degree to back up those foundational things. But a lot of times, you know, the things that makes the difference for a great intern are, are passion and willingness to learn and engage. Aptitude and attitude, and uh, we, exactly the same way, David, we, we prioritize that over probably Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so here's an interesting question. Um, are there any instances of linking graduate project work and company deliverables, i.e. a student's research is used to graduate and can be used by the company? Um, David, maybe we'll shoot that one over to you. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft sponsors and supports a lot of uh, university fellowships and, and research projects. I mean, we have we're constantly looking for opportunities to invest in those. I'm not an expert in this domain for the, what Microsoft is doing, but I do know that we we do look at partners with different schools about how we can, you know, help get people, you know, sponsorship for post grad or graduate graduate work to to you know uh, as as part of a, a business deliverable that we can also help enable somebody for success in school. So that's definitely an area where Microsoft does contribute. Yeah, we we, uh, we have some folks that are doing work study or independent studies. I quite honestly I can't remember the exact term, but anyway, they're doing those types of programs where basically the work, some of the work they're doing for us is their um, is the they're getting credit for at the school. So yeah, that's something that uh, that we do as well. Sure. Similarly, you know, we, we we have a number of different partnerships with various academic institutions, and and I've worked with a few folks, for example. You know that um, I think it was he was at the University of Michigan, and you know their um, cybersecurity program in and around the connected vehicle. So we worked with him while he was in school, and then you know um, after his internship, he came on board to Deloitte to to continue the work. Um, you know under our umbrella uh, going forward. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll also add that, um, you know, as the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, we are a consortia of all of the public institutions of higher education in Virginia. Um, we do know and are aware of um, several opportunities or, or partnerships between companies such as Microsoft or Deloitte um, and a university in which they are working with um, research faculty and, and funding work, whether it's sponsored research. Um, and usually there is a, um, a research faculty in charge of that, but the team is made up of graduate students. And oftentimes that graduate students work might actually be you know, the compelling reason that the company might want to work with said, uh, with said research faculty. And so, um, it, you know, I think that for students that are interested in taking that route, um, it's an opportunity for you to your, um, your faculty advisor or um, research faculty in your department and ask around and say, hey, is there, you know, somebody who's either worked with the Microsofts of the world, the Deloitte's of the world, or is there somebody who wants to? Is there an opportunity for me to do that? Um, I'd be willing to bet that in your university or in your college that there's a program that is um, that is already established for for that route um, if that's something that you're interested in um, we have about one more minute um, so um, i just wanted to ask maybe one more question um, uh, so the question is you all mentioned that we need some experiences prior to joining companies such as yours does that mean acquiring certifications or are there other ways to achieve that experience that you all are seeking um, and so I guess the way that I would ask that is, um, does experience such as coursework and special projects within coursework, does that count as experience when you're looking at internship level uh, applications? Yeah, and I'll kind of kick it off real quick. Uh, it does. Uh, other experiences matter as well. Uh, you know, the whole kind of package matters to me in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I'm going to go back to what David was saying a few minutes ago that, uh, again, what we call aptitude and attitude. Do they want it? Um, you know, does it, are they moving that direction? Is this something they're really interested in? Do they have the passion for it? Um, you know, those are the types of things that really matter to me more than anything else, to be blunt about it. And real quick, before uh, we wrap up, I'll also say, going back to a comment Leon made earlier, it's not just about getting the internship. Once you get that internship, go have coffee with somebody, go have lunch with some different people, uh, meet people. You know, water cooler conversations are the best conversations, and you can do it online however you have to do it these days. But have those conversations so you can learn the business, learn the people, because those are one, they're not, they're part, they, they expand your network. And two, uh, you will understand better more about business, that business in particular, but all business uh, by, by having those conversations and getting to know those people and understanding those things. And I, and I know that's not the question, but I do want to point that out because it's not just about getting the internship. It's about making the most value out of that internship you can make. Excellent point. Thank you. Leon, your final thoughts? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I, I like the aptitude and attitude, right? It's, it's all about your energy. Everything I have, I've, I've either gained through experience or I've, I've self-taught and learned, right? So going out, you know, and, and not just getting certifications, but going out and even, I, I used to always tell people, subscribe to, you know, cybersecurity magazines, read those magazines as you have time, especially as you're, you know, you're there in college to understand what are the business trends that are driving cybersecurity once you get out, right? So that way you can talk intelligently to those things. Additionally, you can volunteer. Um, you know, there are organizations that need help um, with, and, you know, I think, Bobby, you were mentioning, you know, smaller organizations, you know, um, maybe they need help with their information technology, their cybersecurity in their organization. These are things you can gain experience and say, hey, now I've worked with these products. I've worked with these cloud services. I've worked on these things. And that now gives you more fodder uh, or, or more content to put in your um in your resume, right? And, and and obviously then makes you even more attractive because now you've been there, done that. It may not have been paid, but these are things that you can do to really sort of gain the knowledge. And then ultimately, I think, you know, with Bobby and David, and, and you'll hear it from me as well, gaining the experience, um, you know, to really, uh, you know, give you the comfort, give you more importantly, the confidence to be able to go talk to others around these topics and really share your perspectives. Because now, you know, you've built that, that, that um, group of knowledge or that batch of knowledge within yourself to now be able to go and talk comfortably, confidently, intelligently around cyber topics that are going to be relevant and show that you you, you have initiative, you, you're proactive, right? All these all these subtle characteristics that, that I think when I'm interviewing, when I'm looking at um, potential candidates to come join Deloitte, it's, it's, you know, it's those things, those qualities that I'm looking for in people that are going to demonstrate to me that whatever the problem is, we're going to go solve it. We're going to find the answer. We're going to we're going to research. We're going to do whatever is necessary to um to come up with a solution and that's ultimately 
when I look at what 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 I do, what we do as a firm Deloitte for our clients, that's what they our clients expect from us. That we're going to find options, we're going to find solutions, and help them through it. And ultimately, that's what I'm looking for um, in a in a strong candidate for an internship or a campus hire. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, I would just add, like you know, a lot, of, yeah, a lot of times you know, you know, an internship, you know, we're expecting you to be a sponge, you know. And when I was when I was in school, uh, you know, I did a different intern, I did an internship each summer, four internships with with four different companies, and I I found the internships were more about what I didn't want to do versus what I wanted to do in my career. Uh, and I think you know, I had a you know, utilize those experiences to to have uh, meaningful conversations as Leon was describing as I was looking for a full-time a full-time opportunity I knew I knew uh, I was I was smarter about how to communicate what I was looking for in an opportunity and I had a lot of experiences throughout those internships that I was able to leverage to find an opportunity that really made that I was really passionate about and so I would say you know you don't need a lot of experience to be a, an impactful intern it's about going to a company you know, uh, embracing what the challenges that they have for you, you know, expressing what you're interested in and seeing if you can find the right fit. And, you know, if it, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. You probably still learned a lot. And the next, the next time you can look for a better internship that makes more sense for you. Indeed. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that the platform might kick us off in uh, 60 seconds. So I do want to just say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, all of the, the audience and the, the participants, we really appreciate your questions. And to the panel members, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing all of your experience. Um, I think that everyone could agree that this has been incredibly valuable and uh, we just uh, again want to thank you and uh, wish all the students that are applying for internships and jobs the best of luck and uh, don't forget booths tomorrow if you want to talk to recruiters don't forget to join in and with that I, uh, I won't keep you from lunch any longer and wish you a pleasant afternoon. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.